linguistic arches. Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And uh, to get things started today, I first would like to thank some people who have either made a donation directly to the salon or who paid for a copy of my Pay What You Can audiobook, my novel, The Genesis Generation. All of which uh, funds, by the way, are going to uh, pay some of the expenses associated with these podcasts. And those fine souls are Mark C., Eric F., Chelsea S., Colin F., and uh, Colin, yes, I think I got your coded message in that clever number that you chose. Uh, also, I'd like to thank David H., Cord M., Michael H., Grant O., Antique, I think that's A-N-T-E-Q, hope I'm saying that right, and also a nice donation from Jeremy S., so... Uh, I can't thank all of you enough for your support and uh, for being an integral part of these podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon, so thank you all ever so much. And uh, two more people that I would like to thank today are Tom Barbelay and Bruce Damer, who happen to be the two people that we are about to hear from right now. As you already know from my mention in previous podcasts, Tom, uh, among many other things, is the host of the Biota.org podcast. That's B-I-O-T-A dot org. And uh, if you aren't familiar with Biota.org, well, it was created in 1996 to promote and assist in the engineering of artificial life. Now, to some of our fellow saloners, the phrase artificial life may uh, signify life in a cubicle or on an assembly line or driving a delivery truck. And uh, I agree that the lives of most of us uh, are living and our neighbors are living are uh, probably very artificial in many ways. But the artificial life that the folks over at Biota are talking about is something much more fundamental than that. In fact, uh, in a companion interview to the one we're about to hear, Bruce points out that Tom actually coined the perfect acronym for the field of their investigation, and that is COOL, Computational Origins of Life. In other words, can something be created in a computer simulation that approaches something that biologists would be hard-pressed to not call life? But uh, then again, I may have this all wrong, because the truth is that much of their work is, uh, well, way beyond my level of understanding. The reason I'm telling you this is because during the first few minutes of the conversation we're about to hear, there are a couple of things that they're talking about that, well, they're so geeky you may not think you'll be able to follow the rest of the conversation. But my advice is to not give up listening because I think you're going to really enjoy their discussion about how Terence McKenna and psychedelics and machine elves also fit into the thinking about this field of exploration. And uh, interestingly, they even have differing opinions about some of Terence's ideas that uh, may get you to thinking along some lines that you've maybe passed by earlier. In a way, uh, what we're about to hear is a conversation that could have taken place between two characters in a science fiction story. Only uh, these two characters are actually creating this edgy cyber world in their daily work. So uh, now let's join Tom Barbelay and Bruce Damer as they kick around a few ideas about Terrence McKenna, psychedelics, alternate worlds, and artificial life. I'm a new voice to the salon, and uh, I've been a frequent listener. My name is Tom Barbelay, and I have the pleasure of talking with Bruce Damer, who is no stranger to the salon at all. In fact, some of my favorite photos of Bruce are of uh, fans coming to him at Burning Man with his Avatar book. And also, the, the Salon has given me one of the, I guess, most intimate accounts of Bruce, uh, and it's been a, a, a privilege listening to a number of your talks that have appeared in the Salon. Bruce and I have been recording conversations for about five years now. I think I probably have the, uh, the title of the most recorded <laughs> conversations of, of Bruce Damer of roughly, I guess, 100 hours or so. Uh, in the Biota podcast. We typically talk about strictly artificial life-related stuff. Also, the Biota podcast has been mentioned by Lorenzo on a couple of occasions. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, on the salon today and have the chance to, to wrap with Bruce Damer associated with the kind of strange and eclectic legacy of Terence McKenna in the artificial life community. And it's probably, it's probably a good place, Bruce, to introduce what the artificial life community has been historically 
and where we both fit in the puzzle. Now, do you think that there's something that you could start with? Well, I, I could probably give a bit of a summary. Um, one of the interesting things uh, we should probably bring in, too, is recently I, I came into uh, a collection of letters uh, written to and from Terence McKenna around his Time Wave Zero project and the original Time Wave Zero software and manuals, which I've gotten running here because I have old machines that run old software in the computer museum. And and somehow that all weaves into artificial life and machine novelty too. But that that's a new, a fun new thing that's come into the story as we're unraveling McKenna. The artificial life community. We have slightly different views with regards to this. So I'm, I might start my kind of prehistory rap associated with the. I, I think the idea of artificial life predates the traditional discussion of computation and these kind of things. I mean, I. I read back into, into Plato's work a number of the concepts of artificial life associated with what-if scenarios. And it's interesting in terms of the early foundations of the definition of artificial life through Chris Langton as life as it could be, because I think humans have been thinking about life as it could be well prior to computation. But maybe you can pick up the story from there. Well, you know, what's interesting was the at the beginning of research on my PhD on the Evo Grid or Evolution Grid project, I went to see Freeman Dyson at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, uh, which at the same time as I was meeting with Freeman, I trundled across the lawn and met uh, with the archivists uh, for uh, the Institute because the Institute was the home of the first one, one could argue, the first fully complete modern computer designed by John von Neumann uh, under the protection of Robert Oppenheimer, who was then the, the director of the Institute and under attack uh, by the U.S. government. Uh, but von Neumann and his team made this beautiful machine called the Electronic Computer uh, Project, uh, which had internal registers. It did not have patch cords on the outside. It, they convinced IBM to cut apart a punch card machine and they, so they could get uh, programs into this thing. And it, it was the machine everybody copied uh, and it became known as the von Neumann uh, architecture, which we're still with today, folks. But the um, one of the interesting things is the third or so full-scale program written for this machine was an artificial life program uh, by a fellow named Baricelli who uh, appeared at the Institute in the early in 1953, and by the summer of 53, he had what he thought of as numerical symbio-organisms running around in this five kilobit memory made up of uh, vacuum tubes and, and cathode ray tube storage. Uh, he had these critters, uh, he would call them, or running around, and think it was like a lot like Conway's Game of Life from the 1960s or Chris Langton's Cellular Automata from the 80s. This thing was running on this first computer uh, in this summer of 53. So that's fascinating because, you know, this fascination with creating whole ecosystems of lifelike entities and studying them and looking for signs of, you know, authentic evolution and genomes and, um, you know, body plans and things like that is a, has been a fascination of, of computer people ever since. The von Neumann point I just wanted to raise. Bruce and I have a, a series of divergent thoughts that will come up, no doubt, as, as we both narrate this history. Can you give a definition of what a von Neumann machine is, Bruce, and we can move from there? Well, von Neumann, uh, and in a sense, some of von Neumann's writings on this talk about this as the contingency architecture and what they could get working with what they had in the late 40s, basically, which was they would load instructions, low-level uh, machine language instructions would be all lined up in memory, and they may have come off of punch cards or a drum or something, and then they get put into registers, which are fast memory mechanisms, and then the machine goes at the instruction and goes and fetches the data from a short term or a big cache somewhere, does its little operations, and then puts everything neatly back in place and then goes to the next instruction and it may be branching across this list of instructions or just going through them, but that's the basic idea of the 
von Neumann type machine, a uh, serial processing of, of, of these instructions as fast as you can do it. And that's basically what we do today. There's an element of certainty in the von Neumann machine, and that is critical in the localized idea of what a von Neumann machine is. But I think what fascinates me with modern computation, particularly if you look at a series of these things running in parallel, potentially accessing the same information, potentially networked, the boundaries associated with predictability disintegrate relatively rapidly. Even if you have, for example, two of these processes in a, in a dual core or now, even dual core is now dated a quad core machine and they're accessing the same memory, there are certain race conditions, which means that basically they are all trying to access read or write or these kind of things of the memory space, which eliminates some of the certainty. Now, the interesting thing with regards to this idea of certainty is you then, well, ideally, in most cases, will program in the certainty and make sure that uh, you don't get into any of these race conditions. But there are some operations, particularly associated with network processing, where you do actually want to play into some of these elements of the race condition. So it's interesting that you say that we are still dealing with von Neumann computing even to this day, because I would certainly argue against that. This is a non-trivial claim. It's been very curious even raising this in the circles associated with the artificial life community, because there is a, a kind of traditional community that still thinks of modern-day computing as, as being very von Neumann, but I certainly don't consider modern-day computing through the issues that I've described associated with parallel computing networks and these kind of things, being von Neumann. Are you sympathetic to that, Bruce? Well, I think it when we did the programming for the EvoGrid with little thousand atom volumes, the horrifying news is that, you know, in nature, nature's running all thousand of those atoms at the same time and they're slamming against each other. And this is known as a dissipative system in that stuff is trying to move around. And if it's a hot area, uh, the atoms are generally moving to a cooler area, or if there's a denser area, then they're moving. And reactions in the cell largely are happening because uh, a large amount of matter is just slamming into uh, the other matter in the cell, and, and binding sites are found by this stochastic, almost random walk process. And that that's how nature works. Whereas when we try to simulate nature, the reason it takes so long is that we have to line up all those atom-to-atom -atom interactions. And even if we have scalar pipelines, and even if we have everything like that, we have to queue them up and simulate them through this bottleneck. That we have, you know, we, we don't have a computer per atom. Uh, and we don't have a big computer that can, can control the whole volume. So we're doing our best, but we're stuck in these bottlenecks. Otherwise, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take you know, hours or days or weeks to simulate these very, very small volumes, like, like a folding of a protein may take weeks, whereas in nature it's happening in a few nanoseconds or a mi less than a microsecond. So that that's all the bottleneck speaking there. Mm. And I guess this is, this is again where you and I disagree, because my view is that we just don't have the correct model yet, that the computation is there, and certainly the atomic computation is there, associated with actually dividing this information into vastly parallelized computation. It's just a matter of finding the correct model to take this information and optimize it for, for processing. But returning to the idea of what artificial life is in the context, perhaps, of Terence McKenna, there'll be emergences of McKenna through this discussion. In terms of the broad and written down history of artificial life, it started with a fellow called Chris Langton, who basically gathered together a group of thinkers, similar thinkers, and formed a conference series, which is traditionally the way these things happen in academia. What happened through this conference series is that a series of books were written in parallel to this, some highly scientific, some philosophical, and also some popular. And what you saw through this was almost a grass fire of interest in the artificial life idea, probably in the late 80s and early 90s, and certainly this is your and my story and really the story of a number of folks in the biotech community getting their hands on uh, one of these uh, or many of these artificial life related texts and starting to think about life as it could be. And through this, there were probably in the order of maybe 100 or 200 folk 
that actually started creating relatively long-term simulations. And here we're talking almost exclusively about computational simulation, although some of them were robotic simulations as well. So, for example, Stephen Levy's book, Artificial Life, perfectly captures that. The idea is that I guess you have, as I say, these simulators that created their own particular stakes in computational simulation. And Bruce's original work in this was with regards to the simulation of plants. Can you talk a little bit about that, Bruce? Yeah, the the first project of biota.org was to, quote-unquote, grow uh, plants from what are called Lindenmeyer systems and do it in, in the web through Java and VRML. And this is way back, folks. This was started in uh, <clears throat> 96, and, and we did a, a walk-up exhibit at the Electric Garden at SIGGRAPH in 97, just perfectly perfectly timed and titled, and people would extrude these plants and then put them on a virtual island. And that was the idea of using the procedural power of kind of encapsulated, quote-unquote, genomic information to to make a beautiful structure that everybody would recognize. And somewhere in the genes of real plants is something like a rewriting rule, something like an L system, because you can create simple L systems that create uh, that will grow out the three-dimensional structure of a mustard plant, for example, with all the flowers in the right place and the right leaf shapes and everything. So somewhere in nature there are there is code that does this. And th- that was our first project. And I guess in parallel to the formation of Biota, I, well, taking a step back, probably in the early 90s, I wrote antiviral software uh, and at the time I was also writing a book called Field of Chaos, which I've recently uh, published both in physical and electronic copies. And through that antiviral simulation, I developed a lot of extraneous code as well associated with creating landscapes and uh, ideas, I guess, of early cognition and these kind of things. And gathering these ideas together, I created uh, the Noble Ape simulation uh, about actually the same time, Bruce, that you were... Uh, doing the, the first biota project with, with L-System plants. And Noble Life has continued on to this day. It's something where, uh, you know, various thinkers have come through and added their own little pepperings to it. But the, the fundamental idea behind Noble Ape was to create a rich organic environment through simulation, a rich biological simulation with plants, animals, birds, trees, insects, a wide variety of, of different things, and obviously the underlying landscape. And then also have these sentient ape-like creatures, the noble apes that wandered over the environment. And early on it was very primitive, it was uh, black and white graphics, very simple visualisation. But from that I was able to gather together a wide variety of folk that had uh, interests in the particular aspects of noble ape. And really I guess that's been the legacy of noble ape going on, that it's existed both in software, philosophically, and also with regards to these various... uh, intellectuals and others that have wandered through the simulation. In terms of biota, how, how would you describe biota to someone who might listen to the salon? Well, biota is actually um, an, an, a, a community center, an organization, and it has been a conference, and now it is a podcast, uh, thanks to uh, incredible efforts of here of Tom, um, to s- make a discussion happen around can we uh, simulate nature and computers? Can we solve problems of emergence? Can we create systems that complexity science can really use as an experimental laboratory? Uh, can we, what are the philosophical and ethical implications of, of true artificial life should it ever emerge? And Biota has been that now since 1996 when it was founded. Uh, we had four conferences, and we've had, gosh, hundreds of podcasts at this point, Tom. <laughs> Something like that. An embarrassingly large number, yes. Some some from the old folks in the field from the time of Chris Langton and the Artificial Life Conference that, that Tom mentioned, and some also encouraging hobbyists, new people who are entering the field, basically connecting them quickly with the legacy and the history of the medium so that they can really advance a lot more quickly and not reinvent the wheel that others have done before and connect them with academic and industry business people who have the same uh, fascination across 
across these worlds. It is a fascinating idea that the hobbyist, and this is the non-academic fundamentally, someone who is just tinkering away at their particular simulation can actually have an impact on, on the academy as well, so to speak. And I think certainly what I found with the developing no blape early on was that I always felt a, I don't know, a sense that I wasn't actually doing anything that could contribute to a broader academic discussion. And it was only from my experiences with doing academic publishing that I realised that having a project that has gone on for more than 15 years now, as Noble Ape has, actually the, the reverse is true. The academics look at it and think, oh, I wish, you know, I wish I could be doing this kind of thing for such a long period of time. And I think the beauty of the artificial life hobbyist is that they are independent of funding sources. So their passion and their enthusiasm and their drive associated with creating these very rich uh, and interesting systems is independent of, well, their ability to, uh, you know, have a day job and these kind of things. So it has a longevity, an intellectual longevity as well as an actual longevity. But linking the psychedelic community and the artificial life community based on the uh, 15 years of Noble Ape, I was talking with uh, Douglas Rushkoff uh, a few months ago now, and he mentioned that he always saw the two communities very closely aligned, the artificial life community and the psychedelic community, because it related to uh, both a familiarity and acceptance of alternative worlds and a sense that what is presented to us as a, an immediate world need not be or should not be the way that it is. This is very much the uh, life as it could be of Langton. And that gave me an interesting insight because there are, you know, there are ebbs and flows. I mean, certainly Tom Ray and yourself, Bruce, and a, a few others in the community who, of the artificial life community, who also uh, attend uh, psychedelic conferences. And it has always struck me that there are skill sets that are needed from both communities in order to, in order to operate. This, this echoes your thinking, I guess. Yeah, and one of the crossover points, which is very interesting, uh, came when when uh, Terence and I sat down one evening at his house in Hawaii in February of 1999. And Terence, as 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 many of the listeners of this law know, of course, has this idea, and he talks about it: the universe is a novelty conserving engine. You know, in in, in Terence's voice here. So Terence talks about what well, certainly what is obvious to everybody, uh, which is that complexity rolls forward and, and doesn't reverse, so you get life. Um, and Terence, I think, in, in his psychedelic journeying, kind of was interested in this concept and then developed this in his waking hours uh, into a whole set of theories, sort of interlocking theories that, that ended up with the 2012, the concrescence of uh, all of this in 2012, that somehow we were accelerating through this novelty time wave and we were going to reach almost like an infinite speed, almost like the inflationary model of the universe. Um, I can comment about that a little, but what what was interesting that evening in Hawaii is I spent the better part of an hour with Terrence trying to describe to him how the Internet actually worked and why it wasn't a good environment for what he was talking about, why the Internet was too arid, it was too thin, and there was no one actually working on the problem of creating an AI that would somehow rear its head um, in cyberspace. It, the, the environment just wasn't conducive for, it wasn't, it wasn't even conducive for a, a simple artificial life form, let alone uh, a full-blown AI, and that this was actually all pretty much in the realm of fantasy. Uh, and so, because Terence opened the discussion with, I don't suppose you're one of those people who believes that, you know, the AI will, you know, emerge and within 20 minutes will all be, you know, taken over and thing. And I said, no, Terence, I do not. And let me explain why. And I really, I really believe then, and I believe to this day that Terence and many other people are extremely naive. I mean, they, they see a virtual world with, you know, a screensaver with fish swimming on their screen, and they really interpret, they misinterpret that. They think that that is something that one day will be alive, but it's a chimera. It's a, it's truly artificial. It's truly limited. It's like a shadow puppetry. There's no depth to, to any of this. Uh, if you, if you start to study molecular biology 
and how things actually work in the cell, you realize that our computing systems are pathetic. They're they're not even our one of the one of the things that, that happened to me and recently as I joined the uh, astrobiology center at NASA Ames as an associate, and in a conversation down there I had with Andrew Pohoriel, and Andrew really said it well. He's a well-known NASA researcher, uh, has a lot of funded projects in astrobiology and origin of life. And he said, you know what? What the people who are in the computer science side don't understand is that the palette that they are working with to do emergent phenomena, self-assembly, whatever, is so limited in code compared to nature's palette. And they think it's the opposite. They think that they have many more widget and t- and widgets and tools but I, I posit that nature's tool set is much broader uh, and that there is this divide between those who work in, in the computer simulation side and those who work in chemistry. It's a, it's a divide that, in fact, we saw at, at Digital Burgess in 1997 where we climbed up to the Burgess Shale in Canada. The, the paleontologists who were there were detectives. They described themselves as sort of Detectives after the greatest crime in history, the emergence of complex life through the, the Cambrian explosion. Uh, whereas the computer science types, they were, they were world makers. They were little micro gods or nano gods. And they could create their own perfect little worlds and watch the things that are happening. But there, n- no chemist or no bio, biochemist or no paleontologist would really take them seriously because they're staring into the full Monty, the full complex, seething, biochemical, you know, billion year history and everything, you know, stuff coming out of the computer science labs looks interesting, but basically it's not that, not that useful for people who are dealing with the physical world. They would pat, they would pat you on the head and say, very nice. I, I, maybe we could use this to, to figure out how trace fossils are made or something. So, you know, just to conclude this long, long rap, uh, I was really trying to rein Terrence in. And in fact, earlier that same, earlier that year in, in 1998 at a trialogue, and you can hear this on the salon, Terrence, Terrence became more extreme over time. I mean, you know, in the 80s, he was talking about UFOs and stuff. And, you know, and then he kind of pulled back on that. In the 90s, he was talking about AIs, and as the internet grew, and his as his he got his Mac connected to the internet, and he started seeing things, he really extrapolated way too far. He was reading way too many sort of science fantasy books. And at one point in the 1998 trialogue, which I think was at UC Santa Cruz, he was talking about the AI rising and taking us all. Uh, we were all disappear into its folds, uh, you know, in 20 minutes, and. Rupert, uh, Ralph stopped him and said, Terrence, that is a paranoid delusion. There's no basis for reality in that. And I'm just not going to stand for it. I'm not going to even comment. And Rupert did the same. And I had lunch with Ralph earlier this year, and I said, what about this? He said, yeah, well, Rupert and I tried to kind of put a boundary around Terrence and tried to keep him from going way out there. We, we were both opposed to this kind of thing. It just... It just was nonsensical. It went too far. You know, it was, in a sense, and this is my words, you know, it's like the Ray Kurzweil's of the world. And you get a little discredited. I mean, there you are. Terrence is sitting with uh, one of the world's great mathematicians and, uh, and another man steeped in science. And they're kind of looking at him, rolling their eyes because this guy has gone too far. And Dennis McKenna, you know, Terrence's brother, also, um, you know, back 15 years ago in interviews, used to uh, comment in an interview with Peter Gorman that Terrence, you know, his dear beloved brother, uh, often made stuff up. You know, if somebody, if he didn't have an answer to something, he didn't want to be seen to be, you know, up short change, so he would make stuff up, and he would get his facts wrong pretty frequently in the books and in the talks. And a lot of the ideas that Terrence had, came through Dennis, and as Dennis said in that interview in 1993, you know, my brother never checked the fact, checked with me first. 
so in you know in the service of 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 exploring his psychedelic realms, Terrence was making up quite a lot of stuff. He would derive and make up a lot of stuff, and he wouldn't go back and read whether the stuff had any validity. But the stories were good. You know, as Dennis said, my brother never let a fact get in the way of a of a compelling way to tell something, or, or in other words, a, a, a story. So, uh, end of long rap, but that that's kind of uh, wrapping up uh, a bit of what Terence... Terence was fascinated by artificial life. Uh, and in fact, the Evil Grid project, in some ways, is a novelty machine. It's a novelty conserving engine. It's one of the first to be built in, in technology and software with a serious goal and, and measurable results. So the Evil Grid itself, Terence would be, if he was here, he would be fascinated by it. And, and in fact, it might bring him a bit more down to earth because it shows how hard true novelty is if you're trying to simulate nature in a computer. Here, Bruce and I disagree. And folks listening in, I've, I've listened to a lot of Bruce's interviews, many that have appeared through the salon, and the trick with talking to Bruce is actually to leave little drops of crumbs at various points in his, his conversation so you can go back and touch on them. So starting with the origins of Noble Ape and McKenna, I've never met Terence McKenna, but certainly listening to the salon, there have been a number of points that Terence has made which have really captivated me in terms of the fact that at points in developing Noble Ape, I had experiences with what he's describing, maybe um, not necessarily connected with facts, as Bruce has noted, but certainly associated with uh, primate psychology, uh, primate evolution, and uh, the you know, evolution of communities and these kind of things. So certainly through listening to the salon and independently having developed Noble Ape for 15 years, there have been a number of links with what McKenna has said and also my own experiences developing Noble Ape. It's relatively difficult to describe the kind of intimacy that one needs to have with a simulation over such a long period of time, and particularly when you start looking at a simulation in terms of novelty and emergence. Now, emergence here means that it's something that surprises you, but it also has a quality associated with how you can get the information from the simulation. Artificial life simulations are traditionally so complicated that it is impossible, basically, to get all the information from the simulation environment. So you have this kind of distancing of the kind of information that you can get from the simulation, and you have to find different ways of interrogating the simulation to try and get some of this information out. So some of my favourite quotes of McKenna that, uh, that resonated with Noble I think it was a quote of one of his uh, PhD supervisors, where he said that if you looked at the world as a, a world made by angels, it was very disappointing. But if you looked at it as a world made by monkeys, then it was truly amazing. And I think this has been my experience with developing No Blake. So there's this idea of the kind of paranoid monkeys coming down from the trees and with a hyper sense of both fear and also long-term desire kind of charting a path uh, through an environment, which is really the, the narrative associated with No Blake. So from doing these kind of simulations for long periods of time and looking at social evolution through the context of simulation, I started to realise that there was a gross lack of both social science and also true hard science data associated with things that uh, traditionally had been outside the boundaries of science. And the thing that interested me doing artificial life simulation is that you could actually construct simulation environments that weren't necessarily possible in the physical world or even in social science experiments. So the idea of the interrogability of the simulation and also the observability of the simulation led me to start looking at things in the outside world in terms of them being potentially simulations as well. And the idea of information can exist both in uh, deltas and in clouds rather than actual interrogatable points, I think is a very interesting thing that came from this broader artificial life simulation that, for example, in deltas means that you can't really stop something and find something at a, a particular uh, instance because it exists in the flow, and in the cloud that these ideas can exist in multiple points rather than a single point. And traditional science doesn't... Well, physics has a means of interrogating deltas, but in terms of actually understanding clouds, it's, it's more difficult in terms of the spreading of information. 
So the need for a new kind of science has really come through the artificial life community, being distilled in this idea of simulation science. But returning to McKenna, the concept of AI, as Bruce described it, this notion that artificial intelligence will in some way resemble human intelligence, or needs to resemble human intelligence, I think is one of the easy uh, paradoxes to, to squash with artificial life, because certainly what you find through artificial life simulation is that there is a continuum of intelligence. In fact, Roy Plotnick's appearance on Biota, one of the early Biotas associated with the Cambrian explosion, stated this best, this notion that intelligence really is on a continuum where which starts with survival, that when the, the earliest organisms started kind of eking their way towards feeding grounds, they had a view of survival that emerged through into intelligence. And this notion of intelligence as being on not necessarily even a continuum, potentially a multidimensional space, and we are merely, well, maybe a, a small cloudy point, but just one point in this environment. So Bruce and I differ very strongly associated with this idea of machine intelligence and what it will actually look like. So in the context of the singularity movement in particular, I've often described my own views as being post-singular in terms of this notion that what we have in computation is distinctly different than human intelligence, and in many ways it is vastly more powerful than human intelligence. And here I guess I'm, I'm more of a, a McKenna file than, than Bruce's in this regard. And I guess my view is things like the financial system, for example, or the legal system, or these amazing, in some regards, human-created, but vast numbers of humans that have created these environments, have created something which is distinctly larger than human intelligence and also has a far greater survivability, both temporal survivability, because obviously we all have finite lives that we live as, as humans, but also the ability for it to be self-maintaining and also enact terrible things against the humans, which I think in the case of the financial system currently is pretty well self-evident. So I guess my view is post McKenna in that light and also reinforced by years of studying eclectic and diverse simulations because the Noble Ape simulation isn't just a single simulation, it's a series of simulations that are layered progressively and one of the curious things I found with McKenna was that he had a an aversion to weather simulation and the weather simulation has actually been one of the most interesting parts of Noble Ape in terms of the effects of communities and structures based on well simulated meteorological effects. But I guess that brings me up to where you were, Bruce, in terms of talking about AI in the context of human intelligence, which is the very narrow definition offered by the singularity, versus the context of intelligence as being something where we are only one potential exhibit in the cloud of potential intelligences and where things like the Internet and various other forms of machine intelligence are vastly more powerful or... Uh, I don't know, I don't like using the term vastly more intelligent, but certainly can out-survive us. What's, what's your view with regards to the kind of Plotnik definition of survival intelligence and how we relate to that? Well, I think that, you know, I've, I've talked about this on some other podcasts on the Salon, but I think that the we vest far too much in our technology. If, we, if you really look at the Internet as a whole, even the banking system, uh, all this stuff is hand-built and hand-maintained, you know, by millions of people. I think if, if, you know, apart from very, very good, you know, Unix and Linux servers, if you left these systems without somebody poking and prodding them, the whole system would go down, the whole Internet would go down pretty quickly. It's, it, it's almost as though, you know, in the 19th century, if people thought, well, the telegraph system is going to create a super mind or the steam engine rail system, you know, is, is bigger than we can comprehend. Therefore, you know, you'll get Frankenstein coming out of the steam engine and an electricity system. And in the 19, 1930s, you had sort of that that idea with radio and, you know, go ahead, Tom. How do you walk away from the financial system? How do you walk away from it? I mean, you describe these things as computational systems, but they're not just computational systems. They exist 
in a, a philosophical realm which is completely independent from the physical nature of the system. So, I mean, this is the thing that has interested me about Rushkoff's more recent writing, is that the ability to move away from the financial system is not just stopping to maintain the computers that are running the financial system, because it exists as something that is greater than just the computers. So how do you walk away, as with the telegraph system, but in, in, in the context of the financial system, how do you walk away from the financial system in terms of its complete computerization? Well, I think that what I'm trying to get to here is certainly the traders on the floor, the bankers, the policymakers, they're constantly reacting to the dynamic that is rippling through the financial markets, and they're it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. People poke and prod it, and then a wave is set up, and currencies crash, and you know all this this stuff happens. But I think it's not an intelligence. It's just a, a great big hairball mess of stimulus response. It's a huge finite state machine in a sense, and we've built this huge finite state machine, and it comes and bites us all the time. You know the. A good model for this is the International Space Station. You know, all good planning aside, I mean, 13 nations worked on that thing. You know, I worked on some model and modeling and simulation of it back in the in the mid 2000s, and there's a hundred and plus type of connectors on it, and there's you know hundreds of computers running it, and so the crew that are up there find that there's a dynamic to the thing, you know. If, if, for instance, there's a problem rotating the solar panels because there's metal shavings somewhere, it has this ripple effect that goes through the whole station, and you have problems uh, maintaining all kinds of equipment that will go out if power levels drop. So it's just a huge, complex dynamic that we've made. When we were inventing agriculture, we learned about that. We learned about living in a complex, dynamic system, whether to flood the fields at a certain time. Uh, the spreading of, of, of seed and not not weed, um, how to how to keep ergot molds from getting to your your grain supply. You know, human beings have been living in these complex systems for a long time. We're just making them such that now, you know, we we really can't drive them. We're kind of we're we're can't we're we're, we're victims of the of the system that we have made, and maybe we're doing this to the whole planet. But I I don't think that there's an AI or there's a there's anything that's going to emerge other than just a, a huge amount of reacting and maintaining and and fire fire drills. Uh, I don't think that this the system we've made is is an autonomous standalone uh, AI of any sort. Mm, I guess I guess my concern with your definitions is that you're defining. AI and you're defining intelligence and you're defining the human brain very much in terms of what these things aren't. But I, the thing that I am interested in is what these things are and how we can understand these things in the context of potentially ourselves with these things, but also in the context that if these things are destructive, if they are polluting, if they are doing things which are causing us very fundamental problems that I think probably through... Uh, sheer democratic voting, a uh, majority of the world's population or a majority of even, you know, small towns would say they don't want these systems in place, that they don't like these systems, and these systems are ultimately creating control and influence which are completely independent of the problems that people face. There is still no intellectual control. There is no understanding. There is no means of actually, firstly, disassembling these systems, but secondly, finding ways to extract yourself from the system, which seem to be the only two possibilities. And I guess my criticism of Rushkov's work and a lot of the, the theorists that are coming through the dissection of the financial system is that there is no meaningful way to remove oneself from this environment. I guess my discussion associated with being post-singular really motivates intellectuals into starting to analyze these systems and starting to grapple with what they are in some very meaningful sense in the context of where we are, rather than discussing abstract ideas of artificial intelligence that neither map onto, firstly, the financial system or, secondly, human intelligence. And it seems to be a strange kind of argument to say that these things aren't artificial intelligence and they're not intelligence and 
you know, these things are something. They exist in some way. They may appear to be through particular analytical methods just to be a kind of mess, but they are a vastly controlling mess, which seems to be greater than can be described by individuals. They may be initially enacted by individuals, but I think no one individual can intelligibly understand them, which is a property which is really critical. I think not even large groups of individuals can understand them. So the whole notion of kind of collective or single intelligence, human intelligence, being able to dissect these environments seems to be relatively flawed as well. I guess my concern is that I would like to see an emergence of intelligent folk who were able to start breaking apart these things in terms of what they actually are, rather than using kind of negative terms against them. Because without that kind of understanding, that kind of analysis, we'll never be able to extract ourselves from these things. More importantly, these things are evolving, let's use that term, at such a fast rate that the previous theories, the previous means of explanation, uh, and even the ones that are emerging through things like the singularity are fundamentally flawed in terms of the analysis of things such as the financial system, for example. And I guess my interest is that there may be elements of McKenna that could offer some degree of insight into some of these things. So let's turn the conversation in that direction. What do you think Terence could teach us about how we can actually analyse these things? You talked in terms of Terence kind of going far too fast and far too much in a particular direction without a connection to facts. But in terms of the inspirational nature of McKenna, which I guess is motivating both of us actually having this conversation, what elements of McKenna do you think may be useful in terms of understanding these kind of contemporary problems? I think that McKenna's concept of infinite novelty in the time wave in 2012 um, should be really stripped out of out of any of this analysis and did really just put aside. Uh, I did another talk about this on the salon where I really feel that McKenna's own life was accelerating so quickly that he couldn't imagine himself in 2012, and it was really a, a personal eschaton that he was going through. But beyond that, you know, he's no longer with us and, and can't comment. I think that what he would say is, you know, this is his take on it, was that the psychedelic state that you enter, or that, you know, people do enter, uh, allows you to see astoundingly complex you know, for you at that time, realities, you know, whether it be the elf machines or seething geometry or the entire planet and, you know, from space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that the human mind is actually quite capable uh, in these short, in these elevated states of, of grokking uh, a massive amount of, of interlocking complexity. At the same time, and this is very important, this comes from from Leary and, and and all these people who who tripped in the '60s, you see the game, you see the mundane reality. When you when you land from the elevated state, you see the the game that people play, and you actually realize uh, that people are operating on very very simple principles, sort of a stimulus response kind of a principle of, you know, me and I want to get mine or I'm afraid of this, and they, they actually are almost, most people, in even in, in institutions, governments, financial service companies, they act almost in a kindergarten-like way, very, very simplistically. There's a few devious ones amongst us who are creating the financial instruments and really gaming the system, but for the most part, the average member of the public you know, you could almost predict what they're going to say at the next moment. You could almost predict what they're going to, what they're thinking and where they're going to go because they're, they're in, these, in this game, which is relatively simplistic. And so the psychedelic experience and the psychedelic reality reveals these games. And when you land, you look around and say, oh, I'm in this game. But it's, it's a game that's relatively cartoony and kindergarten-y, you know, even up to the level of sitting in the Oval Office with the president. And you realize these guys are operating on poor information. They're operating on um, these assumptions that there are very few sort of brilliant people in the room that, that, that seek to see the whole picture and really profoundly think about things. Very, very few. They're mostly just reacting. 
And to some of them have a vision and some of them have a fundamental understanding, but very few do. And within organizations, you know, government or military, whatever, very, very, very few people are thinking outside of the box or coming up with new things. So we're kind of carried along in this flotation device. Uh, so the psychedelic space allows you to see that and see that you know, with that information, the information that that people are operating on relatively simple uh, needs and simple scenarios, you realize that the system can collapse easily, but it can also be changed relatively easily uh, because it's not very sophisticated. Um, you know, so perhaps that well, Steve Jobs talks about you know doing a trip that he did in probably the '60s or early '70s and realizing he could make a whole new world. That his mind was able and capable of creating. Changing the world and making an entirely new world, and he was and he founded Apple Computer based on that, you know, and and has continued to do that. So the people who've had their minds opened up to the greater reality that they see are the power. They're the power sources. They're the people who can make the future. Uh, and uh, of course, they see the game being played. Some people who are opened up to this reality. Go go back, you know, into their mund what Terence would call the mundane reality through that doorway, and then they they themselves they get uh, alienated, and they 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 check out, they tune out, uh, and it's to their disadvantage because then they become financially disadvantaged and 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 they become you know, disempowered. So the the trick is, and and Terence is one of the few people to ever make an, enough money to live on, talking about. You know mushrooms. Uh, let's face it. This is, as he himself said, this is no way to build a career. Uh, so, for the most of us, uh, if we see these visions and we come back, we have to integrate. You know the, the famous integration phrase. But we can do powerful things in the world uh, with this these insights, and we can see the game for what it is, and we can not get panicked about what people say on TV. Uh, and we can stay outside of the discussions of the, the panic of the day kind of discussions uh, because it is it, you just see it as a game. So, for example, I think the psychedelic experience gives you a long view of history. And Terence was very good at this. Terence, you know, read widely in history, not just alchemical history, but the history of technology, of arts. You know, he was he was really there with it. And so, in 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 the in the mode of Terence, I would say, okay, we're worried about the growing, seeming out of control complexity of the financial system. Well, roll your clock back to the 1870s. Railroads have spread across several continents, and there is no control mechanism. 1860s and 1870s. So you get these head-on collisions of trains. You get complete bedlam. There are all these different railroad companies, and they solved the problem. They invented telegraphy and a whole system of coding and to keep these trains from, from slamming into each other. Roll your clock to the 1920s when there were hundreds of telephone companies, and this is before Ma Bell and others, you know, gobbled them up and created, you know, the Microsoft type of monopoly by the 1930s. So the 1900s to 1920s complete bedlam in the system trying to call between one town and the other when when your phone company is only in your town and they managed to they they moved a step up and by by 1929 1930 they had direct you know dialing where you didn't have to wait for somebody to call you back and connect the line and we gradually mastered the complexity of a new medium that seemed to be out of control and never Never would it be uh, would it be solved, and so I think we we're doing this again, and we connected computers together with money, with trading, with news, uh, and we're in this boom of complexity, and there's a there's a joy in it, but there's also a panic over it's overwhelming us. But I think soon these systems will be subsumed again; they'll just be part of the woodwork. Uh, and they'll just function. Somebody, the engineers will figure it out. The regulators will figure it out. And then we'll be into a new era of, of a new complex system on top of the old one. And we'll think back 
20 years in the future and saying, why did we worry so much about such and such? You know, it was just, it, it was a problem that would get solved. So an important point that you touched on, which I guess is once I've done this relatively, uh, relatively nihilistic negative rap associated with our inability to understand modern technology, the, the secret that we have is communication. The ability, and this is interesting in the psychedelic community because the find the others is inhibited by various legal aspects. But I think the, I mean, we, we, we are both students of computer history. We, we both love the, uh, the rich narrative that computer history provides. You have a shrine set up in your uh, backyard to this, and I maintain a lot of it uh, in my head and my bookshelf. But the idea of Steve Jobs is a good one because Steve Jobs didn't create this stuff alone. He was able to communicate with groups of individuals and actually get a swell of uh, engineering talent to come through and devote their, you know, 16 hours a day, seven days a week to this dream as well. And I think the power that we still hold as uh, humans versus uh, machines is the ability to put ideas out there to communicate and to find ways of actually dissecting and solving these uh, issues. And I guess the feedback that I would give associated with what you've described is that the communication and the ability to analyze these problems and then communicate means of describing them and solutions is the critical factor. And I think when you talk about the game and the elements of the relative simplicity, the game is still maintained by an environment which is very protective. If you look at the financial system and particularly the way the financial system can work against individuals that want to try and step outside of the financial system. But I think the way that we can solve that is through a communication of ideas and uh, utilizing the, the telephone metaphor uh, in terms of actually uh, utilizing these ideas and communicating them and getting together in groups and having discourse and actually creating something uh, which is independent of the environments that we see. So I guess that's my discussion to your solution point, is that the communication part is the critical factor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Bruce, I think this is... Uh, we've, we've kind of covered a number of points here. I'm not sure if you want to continue wrapping on uh, various other artificial life points, but I think we've talked a little bit about machine novelty and hopefully instigated folks in the salon to uh, well, start thinking about such things and also perhaps looking out to the biota community or uh, looking at a variety of different directions. What, what are your kind of concluding thoughts associated with this discussion? Well, I think that another thing to touch upon, I know Salon listeners are waiting for this one, is the machine elves. You know, you talk about Terence McKenna, you cannot not talk about machine elves. So Terence described uh, the mushroom experience as being extremely high-tech and futuristic spaceships around distant worlds, uh, these machine elves, etc. So that for him, at least, the mushroom experience was super high-tech. So does that experience, you know, does it give us any insight into how technology is wrapping itself around each of us? Or are we all becoming machine elves? Mm. Uh, and so... You know, this would this would make a whole rap in, in in itself. So, if I can if I can just give an intro to that point, my interpretation of that, and this actually comes through a conversation that you had with Terence that was put out in the uh, Biota podcast, was the idea that uh, the machine elves exist as the kind of simulated others, and certainly in terms of the noble apes communicating, I've thought a lot about the machine elf communication uh, as well in that light the idea that when you have external entities that are fundamentally internal but represented as external entities communicating in a way which seems to be unintelligible, it is ultimately a, a computational problem. And certainly my own views with regards to the appearance of the machine elves are analogous to looking at, well, firstly, the language of artificial life, the language of communication of these entities, which is a continuous topic in biota, but also an understanding that perhaps this is a, another form of language, ultimately, that we hold, that we can represent in perhaps a computational form, but the need for these entities to communicate in a way which is potentially unintelligible to us, but certainly is intelligible to these externalised entities. 
And I guess that's been my view from a kind of artificial life perspective associated with the machine elves, very much embodied in my own machine apes or editor and their existence externally. Does this gel with, with your own sense? Yeah, I think that certainly, you know, seeing these highly technological worlds that somehow come from somewhere that you cannot, you know, it's the, the future, these worlds are stranger than we can suppose to quote, you know, Whitehead, which is a quotation from Terence. I mean, these these worlds are so fantastic, and you think, how could I have imagined them? Do, do, does this vision of technology come from outside of me? Uh, so there's that whole riff and rap about, well, this is a communication from some other world or from some other beings, and we're we can learn from it and we can build technology based upon it. And that, that's a whole thing. So you could build the, the super ultra nobly from something you saw while taking mushrooms or maybe not. Um, you know, scientists have reported that they have seen the structure of, of uh, chemical compounds uh, that they could never have otherwise seen. And this is, this is certainly not in my experience of the, you know, I, this is not something that I seek out. But the, you know, the question is, can you use the psychedelic state as a tool to create wilder and woollier technologies for, for the Earth, or to understand the fuzz that is of technology that is enveloping the Earth and see it? Maybe to see uh, the threat or to see the benefit to having this fuzz of technology all around us is. Is this going to clothe us and, and keep us warm and, and help us survive, or is this going to suffocate us psychologically, this technology? It's hard to say, but perhaps the psychedelic state is the place to ask the question. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. I'm looking forward to being on location with you in the near future and uh, living in the Bay Area to enjoy many more of these discussions. And certainly you've you mentioned Ralph Abram, but you have an intellectual community, particularly of scientists, that are also part of the psychedelic community that is very rich, and I'm looking forward to having many future discussions with you and with them. Thank you, Tom. And, and just another little uh, a plug for the 2012 events. Uh, you'll be here by then, so there will be events in, um, that have to do with the life of Terence McKenna, but also these ideas will be held in the Bay Area. They'll be held at Esalen Institute in June of 2012. There's an event planned for the end of January in Los Angeles uh, with Lorenzo and myself. And so all of these uh, these events are coming up, and we will be showing uh, Terrence's Time Wave software and looking at some of his thoughts that have just come to light about it. Uh, and just as we kind of unravel the man and see what uh, will go beyond 2012. If we put these things out in podcast form, I know your recent experience trying to hold a talk on Orcas Island, that was also my experience doing a talk at Stanford, that there was a general assumption that these things would appear in podcasts, so perhaps we didn't get the same attendance that we would have gotten. But uh, we, we need to find some way, and this goes out to Lorenzo as well, to actually understand that the physical attendance is probably also beneficial as well as just hearing the audio. And I think perhaps having Terence's original software running is a good indication that folks may sh actually want to attend this thing physically as well as hear the audio after the fact. Yeah, we, we, certainly, we certainly need to sell tickets, folks. So uh, uh, we need to fill the rooms to make the energy happen and the uh, excitement and, the, uh, and the, the words will flow. Bruce, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, Tom. You're listening to The Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. So, uh, what do you think about Bruce's closing comment that maybe uh, we're all becoming machine elves ourselves? Now, if you're new to the salon and aren't familiar with Terence McKenna's thoughts, well, that probably doesn't mean anything to you. But for me, I have to admit that it has now caused me to wonder if maybe when Terence was seeing those machine elves that maybe he was seeing the future once our tech completely encapsulates us. Maybe that's what the future holds for us. Uh, we all become machine elves and have games with self-dribbling basketballs. And uh, now I've probably driven away any new listeners with all of this uh, nonsense, but getting back to the uh, more serious take on the conversation we just heard, 
But my very elementary understanding of the research that's going on in the field of artificial life has actually given me is a significantly greater understanding of uh, just what a miracle of engineering and science our bodies actually are. And uh, perhaps that may be the ultimate gift of this branch of science, which is that uh, we, uh, as a species, begin to more fully appreciate what a fantastic gift uh, human life actually is. And uh, maybe with that awakening, we all begin living lives that are more worthy of these incredible bodies that uh, get us around and uh, sometimes provide a lot of pleasure. I hope that uh, some of our friends here in the salon uh, pick up on this artificial life trail. It's a really fascinating area of deep research, and it's a field that amateurs can also take part in because you don't have to have a bunch of money to uh, get started and participate. And uh, if you're interested, uh, my suggestion for the best place to go would be to uh, go to biota.org and subscribe to Tom's podcast, where you'll uh, find close to 100 programs that speak to all aspects of the field of study that we call artificial life. And uh, you don't have to just be a computer geek to join in. There are uh, countless uh, philosophical and ethical questions to be discussed in this field, uh, not to mention all of the rich ground that new science fiction writers can take on. So check out biota.org uh, on the website where you can uh, find not only information about the podcast, but uh, papers, projects, and a list of key people in the field. It's really a great place to get involved in this fascinating community if these kind of ideas interest you. Now, uh, there are just two quick announcements before I go. First of all, uh, if you can get to New York City for the weekend of October 14th through the 16th of 2011, you won't want to miss the Horizons Perspectives on Psychedelics Conference. Uh, that's being hosted by Judson Memorial Church in the heart of Greenwich Village. This is the fifth year of this important conference, and they're going to be featuring a lot of speakers, including Steve Beyer, who also hosts uh, Spirit Plants Radio, among many other ventures. Also, uh, I think that Jim Fadiman is going to be there, and uh, we're planning on having him as a guest here in the salon later this year when Matt Palomary interviews him for us. But if you want to find a few of the others in the New York City area uh, in just a few weeks, well, this conference is the place to be. And my final announcement is twofold. A few days ago, uh, one of our fellow saloners, Joe Matheny, and I finally connected and uh, talked about a number of things. For one, he had me as a guest on his own podcast, which is called The G-Spot. And uh, that should be easy to remember, but I'll also put a link to uh, his information along with the program notes for today's podcast. Now, Joe has been around this scene for far longer than I have, uh, although our paths have come dangerously close to crossing on several occasions. And uh, yes, I am promoting a podcast on which I make an appearance, which uh, I guess means I'm promoting myself. But the main thing I want to tell you about is that Joe is the copyright owner to several Robert Anton Wilson recordings, and he's going to let me podcast them here in the salon for you. Uh, I'll have more to say about Joe and his generosity in uh, those podcasts that I do, but for all of you Bob Wilson fans, I want you to know that we are in for some more brain candy from Raw in the very near future. Well, that's going to do it for now, and so I'll close today's podcast once again by reminding you that this and most of the podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon are freely available for you to use in your own audio projects under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 License. And if you have any questions about that, just click the Creative Commons link at the bottom of the Psychedelic Salon webpage, which you can get to via psychedelicsalon.us. And if you're interested in some of the stories that uh, might have led you and me to where we're sharing this moment together right now, well, you can uh, read a few of them in my novel, The Genesis Generation, which is available in Kindle and other ebook formats, as well as a pay-what-you-can audiobook read by me. And uh, you can find out more about that at genesisgeneration.us. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends.